Masada did fall in April of uh, 73 is the date that we think is the right date. But before the Romans finally broke in, I mean, the Jews on top of Masada could see them slowly getting closer and closer as the ramp got higher and higher. It just became a matter of time. Uh, there's catapults, there's other kinds of weapons that the Romans have down below, some of which are still visible today, some of the remains of them. Before the Romans could break in, and, and we have this account in Josephus, it's in book uh, uh, seven where he talks about the details of it, great details. And before they broke in at the very end and could come in and basically slaughter all the people, men, women, and children, they met together, according to Josephus, who received this account, for some, he says, from some survivors. 960 total died, and they went into what was later called a suicide pact. And the idea was that 10 of the leading men drew lots, and they agreed that they would then kill all the rest of the 960. And then of those 10, they would draw lots again, and one of them would kill the nine left and then kill himself. So finally, everybody would be dead, but the 10 would actually be killing the other 950, I guess, without the 10. Wow. And so is it, is it, it's suicide in the sense that they agreed but they didn't kill themselves. They allowed themselves to be killed by their comrades. So that's the story Josephus uh, gives. I'm gonna read you what he actually says here. This is in uh, Jewish War Book 7. He says, they died in the belief that they had not left a soul of them alive to fall into Roman hands. And Eleazar, the commander of the Jewish forces, Eleazar ben Yahir, he makes a speech, uh, whether he's, we don't think he said word for word what Josephus records, it's a typical speech. Josephus does this all the time. All ancient historians do. You kind of put in the mouth of a hero what he most likely would have said. And the argument basically was, look, if we allow ourselves to be captured, the women will be raped, the children will be sent to the copper mines, the men will be taken as slaves or killed or crucified. And what's the point? Let's die heroically by our own hands, by our own will, and we can defeat the Romans in death. And that was basically the argument. It's like the, the term death before dishonor. That's right. Exactly. And I, I wrote a book, by the way. Uh, it's called A Noble Death, Suicide and Martyrdom in the Ancient World in which I showed that this idea of choosing death in a dire circumstance like this was seen as a noble and honorable thing. The Romans did the, the same. The Greeks way. and the Romans and even the Jews. For example, King Saul, remember? Yep. He, he has his servant hold the sword up and he falls on his sword. So his what? servant doesn't really kill him, but he aids him or assists him. And that's considered a courageous death or a noble death. So in the ancient world, they didn't have the word suicide. That's a modern kind of word. Right. Uh, and it became, because of Christianity, a sin. Like you commit suicide, you commit adultery, you commit murder, you commit a thing. In the ancient world, you just say what you did. I fell on my sword. I laid my neck down and allowed myself to be killed. And then the discussion comes up, well, was that noble? Was that ignoble? Was that like a courageous thing, a cowardly thing? But the idea of allowing your life to be taken or even taking your life was not necessarily seen as negative. It depended on the circumstances. So as Josephus tells it, it's like the Alamo in America, you know, the last stand idea that you are courageous and you do not surrender and therefore Masada became the kind of last stand of Jewish history and it becomes legendary. And even in the modern state of Israel, 
uh, I'm not sure this is still done, but some elite members of the Israeli forces would go to Masada to do their final swearing in, you know, after they were finished with all their training. And the slogan became Masada will never fall again. So Masada became a symbol of Jewish resistance against uh, oppression or a external enemy and so forth. So that's essentially the Masada story. One of the things that uh, I discovered and now is pretty well accepted, Josephus gives a date for the night that they took their lives or had their lives taken. He says it was the 15th of the month of Xanticus, the Greek month. And if you, that's the Greek month. And if you correlate that with the Jewish month, it's the first month of Nisan and the 15th is Passover. So talk about a last supper. You think of Jesus on Erev Pesach, the night of Passover, eating the last supper. Isn't that These the people gathered together and ate their last meal. And I would tend to trust this. I'd love to hear what Steve thinks, Steve Mason. I would tend to trust it because he doesn't make a point. Oh, and it was Passover. He just gives the date. And right. yet... I have a computer program that does the equivalents for that particular year, according to the new moons. And it was Nisan the 15th, which is Passover. That's April, right? So they passed over into death and escaped bondage from the Romans rather than the Egyptians. So it became a symbol of freedom, even though it involved their death, you see. Can I ask you this? Uh, sure. I I'm I'm not sure how the dates match up to our calendars because I know they're I know it, it's not exactly on 15 for 15. What is the so would the 15th of Nissan be the 15th of April or would it be like the 1st of April? No, nothing to do with our months. These are lunar months. Right. And it would depend on the year. So we would uh, have to you have to look at it and do a calculation. You have to make an equivalent, but typically it's in April or March, late March, early April. You'll notice Passover and Easter move around. Easter is tied to Passover and so forth. That's why I said probably April 1st. Bro. So if it was Passover, that's I'm just adding that as a side point. He doesn't make that point. Therefore, I think it might be valid. But I could imagine if this happened as he reported it, it would be pretty amazing because this would be kind of their night of celebrating freedom from Egyptian bondage you know, the past, the Jewish Passover, and they would be finally not surrendering to the Romans, but courageously dying. And it's possible that uh, that has some historicity to it. That's I do know now in the Masada brochure, you're going to go to Masada with me in October. I'll retell you this story. I'll show you all this stuff firsthand. You and Derek Lambert and Derek's yeah. wife, Ryan, are all going with me. And we'll film some of this and talk about it. But in the brochure you'll get, it's a beautiful brochure by the Israeli National Parks. They mentioned that it was Passover night now. They've actually added that to wow. the brochure. I don't, know if, they, I don't know if they did it because of my work or somebody else's work, but it's pretty well accepted now. But so. you have to admit, whether or whatever, whether you're a believer or you're an atheist, agnostic, whatever, you have to admit that it's a pretty fascinating thing that this date happens to be the same date that falls in all these really specific yeah, it is it is amazing so we have 960 but notice this this is important so he says but an old woman this is josephus i'm reading right from the account an old woman and another a relative of eleazar and five children escaped by concealing themselves in the subterranean aqueducts now, when you go there with me, I'm going to take you down into that subterranean aqueduct where the woman, and notice a relative of Eleazar, he was the commander, and five children. You'd think it almost has to be his children. They were hiding, and she maybe was like the nursemaid or something like that. It's just interesting that Josephus mentions that. Yeah. that some survived. So according to this, seven people survived. And that's supposedly how Josephus got the story. He interviewed them later. They were taken to Rome. The emperor interviewed them. And that's how he says he got the story. 
Wow. Now, so that's the basic story. It was the last stand of the Jewish revolt. To the Romans, it was an embarrassment that you could still have up to a thousand Jews kind of thumbing their nose at Rome and all of its power. And to the Jews, it was a final act of courage. So one of the questions comes up is what happened to the bodies, the skeletons right. or, or the corpses? The most likely thing you would think is the Romans got up there and finally broke through uh, on, on the west side where they built the ramp and they go in and they find everybody's dead. Everybody has been killed and they would be very upset because they would want to punish these people. They would want to send them off in chains to Rome and parade them in some great and grand victory. You know, if you go to Rome today, there's the Ark of Titus that is the triumphant Ark that right. was built, Arch. It's called Arch or Ark of Titus. It yeah. was built in order to um, celebrate the victory of Rome over, over the Jews. And they would have wanted to have these people captive, you know, because they're like the stubborn last defenders of Masada with Eliezer as their head. And uh, in a sense, they robbed them of that chance. And so uh, it was seen as, as a kind of a victory. Now, what happened to the skeletons or the body? Let's call them the bodies at that point. They would be freshly killed bodies. The most likely thing that most have suggested well, let me back up. Some doubt the story, by the way. There you go. The, there's the Arch of Titus. Some doubt the story, and they say that, uh, look, this is legendary. It's embellished. Uh, what are the chances that it's really true? It's like a couple other stories Josephus says that we're not sure about the veracity. He likes to exaggerate, and maybe he just wanted to make heroes of these people. So, there are scholars who've argued that this whole thing of Masada is a kind of national mythology, that if you really check into it, we're not sure. And one of the arguments they make is, where are the thousand people? You know, wouldn't they have remains, uh, some sort of remains, or what did they do with them? So the most likely thing that Juzik suggested is they're pissed off, you know, that these people killed themselves, and they just threw them over the edge. You know, just like garbage, they just threw them over the edge. And that way they could just fall down into the desert, uh, 1,300 feet below, and be eaten by predators and rot in the sun. And within a week, they would be gone. 